So tonight we're going to talk about Dinacharya, which just means daily routine. And these are the routines that keep us in balance throughout the day, that then keeps us in balance throughout the whole week. So this is really good. I'm going to ask you to just mute your microphones um, and turn your videos off. That's great. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen when I can find out what I did with my PowerPoint. There it is. So you should all see um, my PowerPoint, which um, just sort of says Ayurveda daily routines. So let's have a look at it here. And I'm gonna actually going to turn, there we go. So in Ayurveda, timing is everything because ideally we should follow nature's clock. And then following nature's clock is the daily routine or what we call Dinacharya. So, and this is really the cornerstone of Ayurvedic preventative medicine, doing these daily routines. So every day there's a time for the sun to rise, a time for the stars to peek out, and every day, like clockwork, that happens. In fact, we're awake during the day because the sun tells us to. Um, the sun tells us to wake up, then we want to go be active, we want to be productive, and when the sun goes down, that really is a signal for us to sleep. So we rely on waking up in the morning, in sleeping at night, as a consistent schedule. And what varies is how closely we then match to those natural rhythms of the day. So most of us are actually oblivious to nature's clock. We get up at the same time, we go to bed at the same time, we eat because our clock tells us to eat, and we don't really follow those daily rhythms anymore. But because we are part of nature, it is important that we flow with that schedule. It's important to know what the best time is to eat, what is the best time to sleep, to exercise, to meditate, and so on. And when we start going with this flow, we actually start feeling amazing and, um, and, and it's really then easy to go into balance because we've set ourselves up to be in balance. So many of the health complaints that I see from people really start to disappear once we start sort of tuning to the rhythm of nature. So the Ayurvedic daily, daily routine will help you really flush out not only what times are best for specific activities, but why those times are best for specific activities. So that's what we're going to look at today. So you'll see in front of you the daily clock and uh, what this means. So the daily routine is one of the easiest places to start when trying to sort of look at our habits and our routine. And the daily routine is based on the doshas that govern certain times of day too. And then once you understand that, it's really easy to start incorporating that routine right away. And this is where your knowledge of the doshas and their qualities come in handy. So from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., so 6 a.m. in the morning to 10 a.m., this is kapha time. And the energy of kapha is slow and steady, it begins with the sun coming up over the horizon. And then once the sun is up, it's kapha time. And that means the energy in nature is very heavy. And you know that feeling, sort of that heavy stillness very, very early in the morning. Um, that's that kapha time. So also, when we sleep too long, it's hard to wake up, isn't it? If we sleep until after the sun is up, we are rising in that sort of kapha energy of heaviness, and that's going to give us a sluggish start to the day. So because energy is heavy first thing in the morning, we actually should eat a light breakfast. Around 7 or 7.30 would be really good. And we should eat with just enough food to tide us over till lunch. Because in the morning, our acne or our digestive fire it's just waking up too. So we want to support it um, in, in a really good way. We want to kindle it with having a warm breakfast, um, but make sure that your breakfast 
you have enough food to get you through to lunchtime. Kaffir is great for getting things done, this kaffir time. It, it's great for sort of having a to-do list, for, for organizing yourself throughout the day. And that's because the kaffir energy is more of a follower energy. So it'll feel really good to sit down and write out a task list this time of day. Um, and think about it, when we first get to work, we don't feel ultra creative, do we? Or ready to tackle heavy strategy right away. So what if instead we could just follow a simple task list and then get a bunch of work just crossed off our to-do list in the morning? Um, it's that CAFA that gives us that sense to be that organized and, and just methodically go through things. So productivity is actually at its best first thing in the morning with sort of those to-do lists and getting organized for the day. And then between 10 and 2, 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon, this is actually pitta time. So who feel, who, how often do you feel that you need a snack around 10 o'clock in the morning? Well, most people do. And that's because your agni, your digestive fire, has digested breakfast around about now. So now that digestion is actually increasing. So your agony, your digestifier is what says, hey, I'm hungry. And that means it's setting you up nicely to hit your digestive peak at noon. So remember, we're part of nature and all the fires are in alignment at noon. So agony, which is our digestive, our digestive fire in us, and pitta, which is the fire in us and in nature, all relate to the sun, which is the biggest fire, and the sun is strongest at noon. So we, we do tend to have the stronger appetite at noon. And that's when our digestive fire is at its strongest. Culturally, we don't eat our biggest meal at noon, but that's when our digestive fire is the strongest at noon. So in conjunction with our digestion doing a lot of work, our brain also wants to do a lot of work between 10 and 2. So this is the best time to strategize. It's the best time to make new goals, to problem solve, to organize, to analyze. So Pitta governs and transforms our thoughts, our perceptions, and our intellect. And something happened to my screen share. Let me go back to it. There we go. So Pitta's energy is what's going to help you do all those tasks best at that time of day. And then between 2 and 6 in the evening or in the afternoon, this is actually Vata time. So we might, so often about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we might start feeling a little antsy. Uh, we might start sort of craving a snack or coffee or a cup of tea. Uh, we want to sort of chat with co-workers. Does this sound familiar? And that's because it's that vata energy. Vata energy needs to move. It can't sit still. We're probably not hungry when we're snacking here, but we want to snack because we're tired of sitting around. We want to change. We want to be up and out and doing something different. So if we have afternoon meetings, we're probably not going to be very productive in those afternoon meetings. It's going to be hard to pay attention. But it's a great time for creativity and innovation. So creative meetings, to do creative work, this should all be done this time of the day. And one of the best tips um, when Vatra is tossing that around all these sort of creative ideas is to write them down and then make a task list for the next morning that Kaffa is going to happily just, just check off. So we, we, we really want to sort of capture that creativity and, and write that creative list down um, so that you can use it for later when you're in a more methodical frame of mind. And then six o'clock in the evening to 10 o'clock at night is kaffa time again. So after we get home from work, it, it's not time for the computer. It is not time for more work. It's time to relax. And yet how many of us say, okay, we've just got to finish this project or we're going to get on the computer and do things. So kaffa loves food. 
and family. Cafes love to have leisure time, and, and this cafe time means to take it slow. And talking about taking it slow, this is when our digestive fire starts to slow down. So unless it's summer, there's no more sunlight after six o'clock. This is when the fire in the, the sky goes down, and then our digestive fire goes down too. So time to have a light dinner, and it's time for family. It's time for relaxation, for nurturing, for hobbies, for really sort of winding down. And that heavy kapha energy will really help us go to sleep easier. So it is important to be in bed by 10 before that pitta time kicks in. And I'm just going to ask you those on the call, um, if you'll mute your microphones, we won't get any feedback. So that would be great. So if your microphone's on, just, just mute it. And then 10 o'clock at night to 2 o'clock in the morning, this is pitta time. And if we stay up past 10 o'clock at night, we often get a second wind. How many of you have done that, where you push beyond 10 o'clock and all of a sudden, that's it, you're productive? And, and I've heard lots of people say, but I do my best work after 10 o'clock at night or, you know, it, or midnight. So that second wind, though, is that pitter time. And often we, once we go into that pitter time, if we're still awake, then we'll rehash the day's problem. We live frustrations about what was bugging us, who said what to us earlier on that day. We may even get a sudden urge to sort of scrub the kitchen stove or organize the sock drawer by color. Have you ever had that happen where you just have this, this, this urge to get organized? And suddenly we're not tired anymore. And that's that pitta energy kicking back in again. So pitta digests and transforms our thoughts, transforms our perfections. Um, it, everything is, is given to our body and the mind for that entire day in terms of transformation. So pitta usually sneaks in during that transforming, and that's supposed to happen while we sleep. So between the, ten, between the hours of 10 and 2 at night, is when that pitta energy is rejuvenating and restoring and transforming. When we're not asleep, we're awake, we're not allowing that to happen, which is why it's so important to be in bed for about 10. So staying up late is a common cause of digestive orders, disorders too. So bed by 10, which means your digestion is going to be a lot better too to do that because we need to transform. The body needs to go through that rejuvenation process whilst we are asleep. And uh, just leave the sock drawer, it's fine. And then 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. is Vata time. So at this time we're still sleeping or hopefully we're still sleeping, but the body is preparing itself to start waking and to start moving. So this is when we often dream, um, we wake up, having sort of pretty vivid dreams. Um, there's often movement in the colon because this is Vata time and Vata lives in the colon. And this is the time where we're preparing for elimination. Um, this is a great time to, um, for spirituality and meditation. So yogis often get up between 3 and 4 a.m. to do their meditation. Prayer, chanting, this is often done really in the early hours of the morning, because it's a spiritual time. Um, we can also exercise at this time of day because we will get moving easily. That vata sense of movement will help us to exercise this, 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 this time of day. And this will also improve our energy levels for the entire day. So ideally, wake up. So, uh, yep, I'm still talking about um, Dinacharya. So ever wake up about two or three o'clock in the morning where you're unable to sleep again until sunrise? Yeah, I have a lot of people who tell me that. So that's the reason. If we wake up during Vata time, that Vata energy can keep us awake, especially if Vata is high or imbalanced. So then just when the sun creeps up, 
we start to feel heavy again. And like we could sleep, we could go back to sleep at that time. Have you ever sort of thought, oh, six o'clock or 5.30, I've been awake all night and 5.30, I fall back to sleep again. And then you wake up at eight and you're feeling really, really sluggish. So that's a perfect example of where the doshas sort of meet each other in time. So now you know um, how the daily routine works. Let's look at some of the things that we can actually do to improve our routines. So first, I think I keep losing the internet connection. I'm really sorry. Um, I, I'm getting a notice that's saying um, internet connection unstable. And if I've talked to you today, this has been going on all day. So I'm gonna sort of share my screen again with you and hopefully we'll do it. If not, I'll re-record this and send it all out to you so that you will still get it intact. I'm not sure what's happening tonight. So we talked about attuning your biological clock to those in nature. So wake up with the sun. In the winter time, fall coming into winter, you'll notice that we should be waking up a little later than we did in the summertime. And ever notice how in the summertime you're much more alert, you're able to jump out of bed at five o'clock in the morning. Whereas in the winter, it's like, oh, I just want to stay in bed a little bit longer, it's too dark, I don't want to get up. That's your, your natural feeling to sort of stay hunkered up in bed a little bit longer until the sun rises. And so natural urges, really, really important to, um, to not restrain natural urges. In Ayurveda, we believe that this is one of the reasons for, for disease by holding onto those natural urges. So we talked about the early hours of the morning being vata time between two and six. So when we first wake up in the morning, this is the best time to empty the bowels. It doesn't mean, you know, if you don't, something terrible is going to happen. It's just this is vata time. Vata lives in the colon. So you're going to feel lighter and better during the day if you're able to empty your bowels in the morning. And what that does is it clears the stagnation of kapha. So it makes you awake, it makes you alert. Some of the other really nice things to do is washing your face and hands with cool water. Rose water is really nice too. So never suppress those natural urges as much as possible. And then start the day with a glass of warm water that flushes out the toxins. If you have a lot of pitta in you, you're going to do cool water as opposed to warm water. The vatas of you will love this warm water in the morning. And kaffirs can add a little bit of lemon juice in it to sort of stimulate that, that digestion a little bit because they tend to be pretty sluggish. I always start every morning with a glass of warm water and lemon juice. Just remember, if you're adding lemon juice, you need to be drinking that warm water through a straw because um, the lemon juice is acidic and it will take the enamel off your teeth. So uh, just to warn you, drink through a straw. And then we're going to move on to all the different parts of the body and what are some really good routines to set up, daily routines. So first off, we all clean our teeth in the morning. But most of us are using toothpaste, which is pretty heavily laden with sugar. What we actually need is to use a toothpaste that's astringent. When something is astringent, it pulls the gums around the teeth. And once we tighten the gums around the teeth, then we don't get bacteria or are prone to sort of periodontal disease or gingivitis. So any kind of toothpaste that's astringent is better for us. So if you can get hold of neem toothpaste, neem is a very, very astringent oil and um, often used in toothpaste. Uh, you can definitely buy it online. The other really nice thing to do is something called oil pulling. So this may be something you would like to try. Put a little bit of coconut oil or sesame oil into a cup and then you're just going to put it in your mouth and swish. Now, this isn't a swish and spit. This is a swish for about 10 minutes. So people say to me, especially the pitters, well, what am I supposed to do while I'm swishing? I'm not being very productive. So you can take a shower and swish. You can walk the dog and swish, which is what I do. But that's hard when you meet somebody on the street with a dog and they're saying hi and you're like, 
So what you want is that oil to really get in everywhere, all amongst the gums, on the tongue, in the teeth. If you use sesame oil, sesame oil is naturally antibacterial. So it's the best oil to use. Not everybody likes the taste or the texture of sesame oil. So that's why some people use coconut oil. My preference is sesame oil because of the antibacterial um, qualities that it has. So if you do have a lot of cavities and a lot of receding gums, this tends to be a vata disorder or when there's high vata. By chewing black sesame seeds daily, this can actually reduce that, those receding gums and reduce your being prone to having ca cavities. If you're interested in oil pulling, um, I do have a YouTube video, video on just how to do oil pulling. And then let's move on to the eyes now. So funnily enough, actually using something in the nose helps the eyes. So we use something called nasya oil. Nasya just means nose, so it's a nose oil. And nasya oil is just a herbalized oil that we just sort of sniff up the nose um, at night before bed. And not only is it good for sort of hydrating the mucous membranes and stopping bacteria coming into the body, but it also is very, very nourishing for the eyes too. And funnily enough, putting oil in the ears is also good for the eyes. And if you're high in vata, oiling the nose and the ears at night before bed is going to be really good because you tend to dry out in the winter time, in the fall and winter. Um, most of us get drier as we put central heating on, which dries everything out. The air is much drier outside. So let's do some oiling. It's going to keep you grounded and balanced. So sesame oil, you can take just a little bit of warm sesame oil and just put a couple of drops in your ear and then just to hold it this side until it all lubricates in and then again on the other side. And that's going to be really nice. And then the other really nice thing that I've seen, if you're looking for eyes that sort of really glow, then you can have milk with a herb called shatavari. And um, this herb, is, is, is a lubricating herb. We use it often in women's health because of its lubrication qualities, but really nice for the eyes to give a glow to the eyes too. And looking at beautiful things. So if you spend all day on a computer, and many of us do, your eyes get tired, they get fatigued, then just moving your eyesight to something that's beautiful, even if it's a picture of something that's beautiful, can make a big difference um, and take away some of that strain from your eyes. What's even better is if you can actually take a break from the computer and go get outside and look at something that's beautiful. Maybe you just have a bunch of flowers on your desk at work and just that, that sort of looking at something that's more natural, natural colors, is, is going to help with any kind of eye strain. So then moving on from the eyes to the hair and the head. So um, applying oil to the head is really nice. Again, you can use sesame oil. A lot of people use coconut oil. Um, and that very act of applying oil to the head is very, very grounding, once again, to the central nervous system. So if you have any kind of anxiety, any kind of sort of racing thoughts, mind chatter, waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning and not being able to go back to sleep, then applying oil to the hair to the head and the scalp is going to be really grounding for you. Also, the other thing it does is that oil really helps with hair. It stops any kind of scalp dryness, especially this time of year again, prevents headaches if you're prone to headaches, whether they're tension headaches or migraines. If you're prone to those more heating migraine type headaches, then try using coconut oil. If it's more the tension headaches, then sesame oil is really nice too. Applying oil to the head actually prevents hair loss. I've talked to a lot of people this week who've been worried about the amount of hair that they've lost or are in the process of losing. So um, oil is really, really nice. There's a great oil called Bringraj. 
um, which is nice. And, and, and just let me know if, if that's something you're interested in. Just say, hey, Kerry, what was that oil you suggested? And, and I'll talk to you and see if it's indicated for you. If graying of the hair is a problem, this is excess pitta when we gray prematurely. Um, by applying a cooling oil actually helps that. The ancient Vedas said that graying prematurely is because pitters who spend so much time in their head analyzing and thinking, um, they've just worn out the hair roots and that, that's why um, you go gray. I think there's probably something a little bit different than that. And also applying oil to that head, as I said, really helps you sleep because it grounds that central nervous system. So moving from the head to the ears, we talked about sort of sesame oil in the ears. You can also use coconut oil. And it's not only good for the eyes, which we talked about, but it reduces vata symptoms. So if you have any kind of ringing in the ears, noises in the ears, um, tinnitus, then this is a vata problem, and that oiling is going to ground that vata. Any kind of hearing problem, any kind of wax ac accumulation, this is all helped by oiling into the ears. And this doesn't have to be a big deal. You just take a couple of drops of oil and just put it in, just as I showed you earlier on, and, and it, just do it at night time before sleep. And then the nose, so the nasya oil that we talked about um, also is not also good for the eyes, but really good for vata symptoms of anxiety, depression, and dryness. So it's one of the therapeutic treatments that we do. If you come up to the Ayurveda sanctuary, we will apply a nasya oil along with a full body um, oiling. Um, so get used to doing this this time of year. I know it's not something we culturally tend to do, but if there's any anxiety, any kind of depression, which many of us, as we start losing the light, feel a little sort of seasonal effective um, depression, um, then, then this nasya oil is really nice. You can use sesame oil as your nasya oil. You can also use coconut oil. But here I think I prefer the, the medicated um, herbal oil and it's actually just called nasya oil so a really nice routine to get into and then let's not forget our mouth so we brush our teeth with a more stringent toothpaste like neem toothpaste and then we tongue scrape you are all tongue scraping by now you better be and uh, often that's one of the habits that once we start tongue scraping. I've had people say, oh, well, I forgot my warm water in the morning and I forgot what foods I was supposed to eat, but I'm doing my tongue scraping. Um, oil pulling is going to help reduce infection. In fact, you will see a difference. Uh, your dentist will definitely see a difference um, and ask you what you're doing over a period of time if you're oil pulling regularly. So these are all good things for your mouth to do. The oil massage, so it's called um, Abhyanga is the Sanskrit term, and this is important for everybody. So if you can self-massage, you can either use sesame oil, you can use coconut oil if you have more heating in you, more pitta in you. Um, mustard oil is really good for kaphas. Um, or we've talked about the special different oils. Just going to ask you to turn your, um, would you please turn your microphone off if you've just joined us? Otherwise, we can hear everything. Thanks. Um, there are vata oils, pitta oils, and kapha oils. Let me know if that's something you, you would like that's been designed just for you. So what that self-massage does is it improves skin. And many of you already realize that the skin gets softer. You would expect that with any kind of massage lotion or oil. But it also tones the muscles. Hey, that's good. You don't have to exercise and still get toned muscle. Tones those blood vessels too. And one of the biggest reasons we do it is because of that soothing action on the central nervous system. So self-care, what better thing can we do for ourselves than that self-care? We all have exacerbated central nervous systems. We all have some anxiety going on, especially this time of year as the holidays approaching. 
we're traveling, we're seeing family members, it's going to heighten that central nervous system. So oiling is really good for that. And I've talked with each one of you about how to oil the whole body. But what's really nice is if we massage the soles of our feet before bed, this has a wonderful grounding element to it. So we feel more energized. It combats fatigue, so a really nice thing to do. Um, it's great for calming anxiety. So that's why I told every one of you to massage the soles of your feet before bed. Put socks on afterwards if you want, if you're worried about oil um, seeping onto the sheets. If you're not a person that can wear socks because you get too heated at night, you're using a more cooling oil. Um, and many people have sort of said, well, I do have oil on the sheets or I have oil on my towels. You can add just a little bicarbonate of soda or baking soda into the wash and that'll take care of the oil that you may have in your towels or on your sheets or on your socks. So that's the oil massage, really important to do. And then exercise. So the best time is to exercise in the morning. We've just talked about that as we've gone through the day. When is the best time to do different things during the day? We said first thing in the morning for all of us is actually the best time to exercise. But here's where Ayurveda said you should only exercise until you have to mouth breathe. So if you are pounding a treadmill, if you are exhausted after your workout, if you feel depleted, you are doing way too much. So now, kaffirs do need a little bit more exercise because they need to push themselves. So they need, um, they can be sluggish. So we need to get their lymphatic system moving. So they need more vigorous exercise. Whereas pitters, who are quite happy doing the more vigorous exercise, actually need to take a little bit of a step back and do things that are non-competitive. So I see pitters spinning a lot in classes where they're racing against everybody else. And if they're not racing against somebody else, then they're turning the dial to, to better themselves. I'll see pitters playing tennis, doing all those competitive sports. And I've often said to a pitter, you know, let, let's just do something non-competitive. How about swimming? And it'll be the pitter that's, that's like, yeah, I can do 50 laps before breakfast. So uh, non-competitive if you're pitter. And then vatas need to do gentle exercise. I'll see vatas running a lot because they like that, that feeling of movement through air and space. So we see vatas doing yoga. We see them doing aerial yoga, dancing, um, and running. And yet that sort of pounding the pavement is really not good for vatas. It's too depleting for them and it's going to wear on their joints too much. So gentle walking, gentle yoga for vatas. So as you look at the exercises that are best for you, you know, pay attention to, to where you are and uh, do the right kind of exercise for you. And then bathing. So how many of us still bathe? Most of us jump in the shower because we're in such a rush and then that's it. And I'm going to encourage you to think about a bath because there's something very relaxing that you don't get that same relaxation in, an, in a shower. So if you take a bath, if you have a lot of vata in you, and even if you're vata pitta, you have a dual combination vata pitta, you're going to be vata this time of year. If you're vata kapha, you're vata this time of year because we're in vata season. So vatas need warm water. They can't do too hot water and they certainly can't do cool water. And tulsi leaves are really nice. If you're used to drinking tulsi tea or if you have a health food store close by you or a store that does lots of loose tea, you can get tulsi leaves. You may grow it in your garden. I don't know. And then just put some Tulsi leaves in your bath and that's going to be really nice for calming that sort of excess excitability and that mind excitability that we get with batters. If you're pitters, you don't do hot baths because you don't like hot baths. Um, so you need cooler water and I'm going to suggest you put some sandalwood essential oil in. Sandalwood is really nice for pitters 
because sandalwood is cooling. And remember, petals often get overheated. And then lastly, kaffirs, our poor sluggish kaffirs. They need really hot water. We've got to get something to stimulate them. I mean, you can actually put pepper, like pepper flakes, um, in your bath to sort of stimulate that lymphatic system. And you're going to feel energized after a bath, which is what we want for kaffirs to feel energized because they can feel sluggish so easily. And then clothing. So first off, wear something that you feel gorgeous in. You know, I, where was I the other day? I think I was at a, a, a theater. That's right. We were watching a play and I looked around and everybody was in black or gray. And I thought, where's the color? Now I know as women, we often wear black because it makes us look thin, but, um, or thinner, but where's, here's me and my gray top, but where's, where is the color? Where, so be vibrant. Wear the color that you want that day. Now, if you're corporate, you can't necessarily wear sort of a bright red suit, but you could wear bright red underwear and nobody's going to know the difference. And why not? It's fun. So A, wear something that you like to wear because it makes you feel good. And then wear natural fibers as much as possible. Our skin is, is one of the biggest organs of detoxification. So it has to breathe. It can't breathe in synthetic clothes. It can only breathe in natural fibers. So what's natural? Cotton, wool, silk, and linen. You can even use a semi-synthetic like rayon if you want to. That way, your skin can still breathe, especially as we're, in, we're indoors all the time right now. We're wearing long sleeves. It needs to. You'll feel a lot better if you wear more natural fibers. Obviously, if you can't wear wool, um, many people get very sensitive to wool, then that's fine. But certainly next to the skin, have some cotton or some silk next to the skin. And then food. So eat regularly. And, and we've talked about sort of no snacking between meals. Um, I want you to sort of go back to this thinking of um, your belly is having this fire in your belly. This is acne. We're going to talk about that next month. Um, but acne is your digestive fire. And when we constantly graze, which a lot of people are still doing, because there is a fad out there, there is still the, the belief, it, it's misled, it's not true anymore, it's been debunked, but there is the belief that if we eat little and often, it'll keep our blood sugars up. And that's absolutely true if you're a diabetic. But if you are not a diabetic, you do not need to be eating little and often. It's not going to keep your blood sugars up. It's, in fact, just going to put weight on. So coming back to that fire that, that's sort of in your belly, when, when we have our first meal of the day, um, let's say that's our breakfast, it's like putting a log on that fire. And that fire burns through that log. Um, we assimilate the nutrition from, from that food. And then we get good and hungry for the next meal. Now, here's somebody who grazes throughout the day. Here goes breakfast. Here's our first log. A couple of hours later, here's a handful of nuts. A couple of hours later, here's a slice of toast. A couple of hours later, here's some fruit. A couple of hours later, there's something else. Oh, now it's lunchtime. And we have these mini meals throughout the whole day. Well, what happens to a fire if you keep putting logs on? What happens in the end is that fire just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. You're going to snuff it out. And that's why so many people have that sluggish digestion, because they're just not eating correct. So we want to get good and hungry between meals. So if you thought that snacking was a good thing for you or grazing or having four or five small meals a day was good for you, I'm going to challenge you to think a different way and um, actually eat three good meals a day piece of fruit mid-afternoon, piece of, piece of fruit mid-morning is fine, but that's it, no snacking. So you should have at least three hours between your last meal and bed. So if you're eating at seven and going to bed at nine, which a lot of people are that I talk to, that's not enough time. You're gonna have a, you're again gonna have a sluggish digestive system because remember that digestive fire is really low at nighttime or in kapha time. 
So if you have a big meal then, and you haven't allowed time to digest, that food is just going to sit there and you won't be able to you won't be able to digest it so one of two things that will happen you'll either wake up in the morning ravenous because you didn't digest that food so your body doesn't think it had anything or absolutely sluggish and not hungry at all for breakfast because your your body's trying to still digest that food from the night before so eat according to your metabolic type you know by now what your metabolic type is um, so eat the foods that are right for you and then eat according to the season too. When we eat out of the season, we have problems. I often um, use the analogy of strawberries. So if I've already used that with you, bear with me again. But strawberries come out late spring, early summer and strawberries are a cooling fruit. They come out to help us well, they're not for us at all, but they, they, what they do in the body is they cool the heat of the summer and, and it's a hot time of year. So ideal for the time of year. But if you were to put those same strawberries on your breakfast oatmeal in the middle of winter, you're going to feel sluggish. And, and you would never attribute sluggishness to strawberries. And it's just because we're eating the foods in the wrong time of year. So we have to be careful here because we can go to the grocery store and in today's world, shipping in from all over the world, we can get anything we want. We can get papayas, mangoes, coconuts, whatever we want. So I want you to think more seasonally. Right now, we're in fall. This is a great time for all those root vegetables. They're grounding, they're heavy, they're nourishing. They ground that light, airy, vata season. So it's exactly what we need this time of year come winter time we'll add the heavier root or the heavier grains and nuts to combat the dryness and the coldness of winter we need the oils from the nuts come spring we need to lighten up and we need those spring greens which are naturally detoxifying to combat the allergy season and then in summertime we need those cooling foods as well so when we eat according to the seasons, we're really helping our own body as well. Important to eat slowly and important to eat mindfully with no multitasking. That is so easy to say and it is so difficult to do in a world where we constantly have to do more, be more, produce more. Um, and I'm guilty of it too. So it is really important that at meal times to sit and just eat, not to eat and sit on the on the computer and check emails, not to eat and watch TV. Think about it. Here's your bowl of food or your plate of food. You're watching TV. You're so absorbed by the TV that all you are doing is shoveling it in. If I was to ask you at the end of your meal, was that good? You'd be like, yeah, sure, I think so. Because you're so absorbed in what you're watching, you can't pay attention to that food and how it feels and whether it's nourishing you and whether it's spicy or not spicy, warm or not warm. Um, you're just shoveling it down at that point. So I'm going to challenge you to each of your three meals to just sit and eat. Get back in, in, in contact, in communication with your food and how it feels for you. So avoid heavy foods at night. And again, that's because our digestive fire is so low at night. night. So this is where the word supper comes from. Supper comes from the French word um, soup. Um, because it, we're supposed to just have like a bowl of broth in the evening. Something very, very light that's easily to digest. It's not our culture, is it, to do that? But that's going to help us best. Walk after lunch. This says wall after lunch, but actually walk. Um, so when you have your lunch, no matter how busy you are, I'm going to encourage you to take a break for lunch. Even if you just take 15 minutes, eat your lunch, 10 minutes, and go for a five-minute walk. But that walk after lunch will help stimulate that digestion too. And after your evening meal, take a stroll. Um, it's hard to get outside as it gets colder, but I'm going to encourage you, put your boots, your scarf, and your coat on, and take a stroll, 
and that's going to really refresh your mind and body. And if you do it after you've eaten, and then that's going to be your transition between sort of the busy part of the evening. Now you come back, perhaps read, perhaps watch TV at this point, um, do a hobby, knit a sweater, whatever it is you're doing. That will be a good transition for you. And then sleep. So we have a calm mind because we've done all these, these routines. We've put oil drops in our ears. We've had a warm bath. We've had a great dinner that's right for us in the right season. And we've got a really nice, comfortable bed. So you would think you're going to get a good night's sleep. But how many people still can't sleep? 48% of Americans cannot sleep, have insomnia. That means half our population either can't get to sleep or can't stay asleep. So what is going on that one in two people are not sleeping at night? So this is for those people of which there are so many. So tips to sleep. Go to sleep at the same time each night. So important to go to bed before 10. It doesn't mean you have to sleep, but you should be in bed for about 10. So some really nice things to do. You can take half a teaspoon of ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is a herb. And again, if you can't remember what that is, um, let me know. But you'll, you'll have a copy of this tomorrow, this um, presentation. So ashwagandha is really nice. And uh, you can have that in warm milk before bed. So if you're not doing dairy, that's perfectly fine. You can have some almond milk, depending on your metabolic type. Rice milk is really good. Oatmeal is good. And almond milk is really nice. If you're more heated, then coconut milk is really nice. A sprinkle of nutmeg. Nutmeg is um, a relaxant. So it actually prepares you for sleep. I have a lot of vata in me. I'm vata pitta. So that vata in me can get easily disrupted as far as sleep and I'm a very light sleeper. So the dog's only got to bark, or my husband's snoring, and that's it, I'm awake for the night. So I will often make a glass of warm milk and put some nutmeg and a little bit of turmeric, because I'm pitter too, and, uh, and, and I'll drink that, I'll read for 10 minutes, and that's it, I'm out again. And I used to have sleep problems. So um, another thing that you could do, warm milk and ghee with nutmeg is really nice as well. That's restorative as well. It's rejuvenating as well. If you're high in kapha, you do not want to be doing ghee. And so in general, what should we be doing? In the morning, let's do work that involves focus and concentration. So that's when we have all our to-do lists. We start the day, we're in kapha time. This is our to-do list for being organized throughout the day. That's going to set you up for success throughout the day. In the afternoon is when we're creative. So we can either do physical things. We need to move. It's that a time. We're going to want to move around. But our mind is also creative. And I don't mean creative like we're going to get the Play-Doh out and we're going to color. I mean creative in terms of we're going to suddenly come up with the answer to a problem that you've had for ages. It's that thinking outside the box time. So allow that creativity in the afternoon. And it often comes because we're doing physical things. And then in the evening, you need to relax. So this is not the time to do projects. And I know many of you take work home, many of you are working in the evening. And um, I'm gonna encourage you to think a different way. So relax. This is not the time to, oh, I've still got to do laundry and I've still got to do this and I've got to organize that. You know, I want you to be truly relaxed so that you can get a really good night's sleep. So any questions? I'm going to stop sharing the um, PowerPoint, which means I come back to you. And uh, you're all muted right now. You can unmute if you want to, if you have any questions at all about sort of daily routines and what they mean. Well, let me ask you, did it kind of make sense to you? <coughs> yes. Okay, great. Anybody um, having problems? 
initiating daily routines, knowing quite what to do? Um, I, um, this is Kim, and I have a question about the massage. Um, I came in right at that um, time, and so I'll have to watch it again. But um, my question is, um, generally in the wintertime, I don't take showers in the morning. I take my shower in the evening. Does it really matter what time you do the massage as long as you, um, you know, get it in daily? You got it, Kim. So as long as you're getting it in daily, that, that's most important. I actually prefer it in the evening. So um, I think it's better in the evening for a lot of people. So the fact that you're taking sort of that shower and then, then you're doing that whole sort of relaxation thing before bed, mm -hmm. that's a really nice routine for you. Okay, not great. Yeah, not everybody wants to take showers in the evening. And I, you know, do you like taking baths too, Kim? Um, I'm, I'm typically a shower person, but I heard, um, got the information about, um, you know, bathing. So I'm going to begin to incorporate that in at least once a week. Great. Nice. That, that's a wonderful thing to do. So yeah, very nice. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. This is Carlene. Hi, Carlene. Good to see you here. Thank you. I have I have been trying to get to bed about 10 p.m. And when I get into bed, I just find myself still not being settled. You know, I'm still awake. Yeah. And I wanted to, you know, being that I'm new to um, the program, when will I start seeing a turnaround in terms of me just <laughs> falling asleep? So that's a great question. And everybody is different. So um, I don't know in answer when you're going to suddenly sort of, you know, head hits the pillow and then you're out like a light, but it is a process. And what time are you, you normally used to go into sleep, Colleen? About uh, 1.32 in the morning. Yeah. So that sudden jump from 1.32 in the morning all the way to 10 is too much of a leap. Okay. Your body's like, hey, I am not used to this. Right. Not right. the way I do things. So I would actually suggest that we move much, much slower than that. And I commend you for, try, for, for sort of going gung-ho and thinking this is the right thing for me. <laughs> So if you're used to going to bed about 1.30 in the morning, then maybe for a week you go to bed at 1, and then maybe for a week at 12.30. And then the body almost doesn't notice that. Mm. And, then, and then before you know it, you'll be thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm already down to 11 o'clock. This is so much better than the way it used to be. But it's too much of a jump right now for you, love. Yeah, you're okay. going to sit there and twiddle your thumbs and wondering what you're doing. Yes. All right. Thank you. Any other questions there? Has anybody done oil pulling yet? No. Uh, this is um, Kim again. Um, I do it daily. I, I was doing it before I started the program. Um, but what I've done differently now is change the um, oil. Before I used to do um, olive oil. Okay. And um, now I do the coconut oil. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's something that um, has been easy to um, maintain in a daily routine. Excellent. Excellent. And Kim, how long do you oil for? So when you've got that coconut oil in your mouth, or it used to be the olive oil, how long would you actually do that for? Um, I had to build up to it. Initially, you know, I couldn't um, tolerate it too long, but now until it's just like watery. Um, sometimes I'm just, you know, I'll um, um, do my oil and I'm doing things. And then if I sort of like get a gag reflex, re re action and I know it's time to you know um um spit it out <laughs> so I, I think I'm going anywhere maybe like um 15 minutes maybe 10 to 15 minutes okay excellent that, that's tremendous good for you and how is your oral health do you find that when you go to the dentist he's pretty pleased with you or she's pretty pleased with you I'm glad you asked because I just um had um just I had a visit um, last week and he actually did say things. I have to get a crown, but that's not related to just, you know, what's going on in my mouth. Um, but he just said, you know, keep flossing. It looks good. Mm -hmm. So great. 
Mm. Wonderful. Excellent. It, it's a routine to get into for sure. It takes a little while to get into oil pulling, but I think once you start doing it, the, the benefits are definitely worth it. Now, what I have um, not started yet is the tongue scraping. Okay. So why does that add an additional benefit? What tongue scraping does is it removes the toxins off your mouth. So when you do it, you'll see all the gunk that comes off. If you don't have a tongue scraper, you, you could, can use the back of a spoon, a stainless steel spoon too, except for that can initiate the gag reflex. So you want to you sort of um, use the tongue scraper and just pull it down. And all that white gunk all right, mm -hmm. is actually what we call armor digestive toxin. So we do not want to regurg we don't want to sort of digest that again. We want to okay. get rid of it. And the cleaner your diet is or the better your diet is for, for you, you'll see less and less of that white coating. Mm. So when we have a lot of that sort of digestive toxin, that's when we tend to cleanse. Um, and you'll see after a cleanse that you'll reduce that. Um, but oil pulling also helps with armor too, because armor is not just on the tongue. If it's on the tongue, then it's in the whole digestive system and mm. it's also in the mouth. So your oil pulling is definitely helping. Okay. You'll see it. Once you tongue scrape, there's no going back. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. All right, then. Then um, I'm going to close this out here. Um, just wanted to remind you that next month um, we will be talking about acne, our digestifier, and why it's so important and how we can have sluggish acne, how we can have too sharp acne, which is when we get hyperacidity, um, where we can have stable acne, and what do we do about it, and what are some of the things. And if we do have sort of sluggish acne, um, what does that result in? What are some of the diseases that result because our digestion's not working well, our digestive fire's not working well? So that'll be next month, and I'll definitely send out an invite for you, just as you got one for this month. Mm -hmm. I'll record this. I'm not sure what happened at the beginning of this. I think I got kicked out a couple of times. It just said internet unstable. So there may be some gaps in it. I don't know. Um, I'll have to watch the recording and see. But thanks so much. It was lovely to see you here tonight. Thanks for joining me. And I'll be talking with all of you certainly um, soon. But if I'm not talking to you before next week, have a happy Thanksgiving and uh, thoroughly enjoy the holidays. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. You as well. Good night. Good night.